Hello, everyone, and we're glad you can attend Attitudes Weekly ADHD Experts webinar. Just an introductory note before we get started. If you've listened to one of our webinars before, you know we offer attendees a, cert a certificate of attendance. When the webinar ends, a post-event survey will pop up. It will list three questions about the quality of the webinar, followed by three questions titled required for certificate. If you would like a certificate of attendance emailed to you, you should answer those three questions. If you don't want a certificate, obviously don't answer them. So today's webinar takes an in-depth view of the ADHD brain as researchers make major strides in uncovering the neuroscience behind it and how that differs from the neurotypical brain. Brain imaging, structural MRI, functional MRI, and brain connectivity techniques is giving the world a better understanding of how the ADHD brain works and how treatment affects it. All the studies and all the data from those studies are enabling researchers to, dis to dismiss many of the myths about ADHD, among those diagnosed with the condition as well as those unaffected by it. We are very happy to have Dr. Jo Jonathan Posner here today to tell us about the latest science behind the ADHD brain. He is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Columbia University and board certified in adult and child psychiatry. Dr. Posner has been treating adults and children with ADHD for more than a decade. He is Director of Columbia University's MRI Research Laboratory, dedicated to the study of ADHD and related behaviors. You can ask questions of Dr. Posner anytime during the webinar. We will try to get to as many of them as we can after his presentation. To download the presentation slides of this webinar, click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. If you do not see the Event Resources tab, you need to refresh the page. So after all that housekeeping, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Posner. It's great to have you here today. Great. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so I just wanted to say a few other um, words about uh, my background um, and then give you a little bit of an outline of the talk. Um, so as Wayne mentioned, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist, um, and I have been treating kids for uh, close to 15 years. Um, but in addition to, to working with um, children in clinical practice, I'm also a uh, professor of associate professor of psychiatry um, at Columbia University and direct um, an MRI um, laboratory where we um, study uh, the brain mechanisms underlying ADHD um, and related behaviors. Um, so things like impulsivity and inattention. Um, and the way that I decided to structure this talk is a little bit different from the initial um, description that was provided. I wanted to first first uh, start with um, some common uh, myths or misconceptions about ADHD, um, because I think those um, drive a lot of uh, what people think of the condition. Um, and then towards the second half of the talk, I'm going to delve into um, some of the MRI research um, that my lab um, is conducting about ADHD. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to start with uh, the first uh, very common uh, misconception or myth about ADHD, which is that um, it's not a real diagnosis. Um, and that's a, a perception that I'm sure uh, many of you have seen. Um, you can see evidence of that um, in lots of uh, popular press and, and media. Um, and so the question is, what's sort of driving that myth and, and what, do we, um, what do we know about that? Um, and it's my view that um, the reason why that um, Myth, misconception really uh, continued to persist um, is this idea that um, in psychiatry and in medicine that we call biological validity. Um, and essentially what biological validity refers to is um, 
really understanding um, and defining the underlying biological causes of, uh, of a disorder. Um, and in most areas of medicine, uh, we have that uh, very well defined. Um, psychiatry, however, is, is somewhat of an exception in that regard. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, if you take the uh, example of bacterial pneumonia, um, if someone goes to a physician with um, a certain cluster of symptoms, so fever, cough, shortness of breath, um, the physician is going to consider bacterial pneumonia as the uh, um, potential diagnosis. Um, Within that diagnosis, um, the underlying disease processes, the, what we call the pathology of the disorder, are uh, well worked out. Uh, we know that it's caused by a bacteria invading the lungs, leading to an inflammatory response uh, and leading to symptoms. Um, and not only that, but we also have um, objective um, diagnostic tests that can confirm that a person has pneumonia. So, for example, a chest X-ray um, or collecting uh, cultures of the actual bacteria. Uh, with that information at hand, uh, the physician then lumps together the symptoms that he or she is collecting plus the diagnostic tests. Um, and then provides a treatment. Um, and it's a treatment that specifically targets that underlying uh, pathology. The case in psychiatry, um, and specifically in ADHD, um, is really quite different. Uh, we have the symptoms and we have the treatment, um, but we lack those two other important ingredients. We, we don't yet know um, the exact uh, pathology, or in other words, we don't quite know the exact underlying biological mechanisms um, that lead to ADHD. Um, and we also um, still don't have objective diagnostic tests. Um, so we have subjective reports, um, subjective reports of symptoms, um, but we don't have an objective diagnostic measure. Um, and one question um, that often gets asked to me as an MRI researcher is whether ADHD can be diagnosed with a brain scan. And for that, I can tell you, um, unfortunately, but unequivocally, no, it, it really cannot at this point. Um, that is something that we are, we, my lab and other labs are actively working on, and we hope that one day we will we'll get there. Um, but the um, the findings on MRI are far too subtle um, to provide a diagnostic instrument. In other words, there's too much overlap between what we see uh, in an ADHD brain versus a non-ADHD brain uh, to rely upon it as a, a, a diagnostic instrument. Um, now, I... I tried to, to make the point that in psychiatry um, at large, so this is true of all psychiatric disorders, not just, um, not just ADHD, we lack uh, biological validity. However, um, there are other um, important ways that we can uh, be confident of our uh, diagnoses, and I want to go through a couple of those with you. Um, so the first is what we call reliability. Um, and what we mean by that is that if two different uh, clinicians evaluate the same child, are they likely to come up with the same diagnosis? So in other words, if I evaluate a child um, and a colleague evaluates that child, not knowing what my thoughts were, will that colleague and I uh, both independently come to the diagnosis of ADHD? Um, and it turns out um, that ADHD actually is a, a very reliable um, diagnosis. Um, and these studies were done in what was called the DSM field trials. Um, and it turns out that ADHD is actually one of the most um, reliable diagnoses that we have um, in all of psychiatry, and in particular um, in child psychiatry. Um, the reliability of the diagnosis of ADHD is about on par with the reliability of diagnosing uh, pneumonia on chest X-ray, uh, which is considered quite good. Um, the other important ingredient, ingredient uh, that we look at to determine if our diagnoses are real or meaningful uh, 
um, is what we call predictive validity. Um, and what, uh, what we mean by that is that if a, if a child is given the diagnosis of ADHD, can that actually predict uh, meaningful outcomes? Um, and in that case, um, we can unequivocally say, yes, it does. Um, and the reason we know that is from what we call um, longitudinal studies. So a child is diagnosed with ADHD, and then we look at how um, that child or a group of children do over a number of years. Um, and from those types of studies, we know that, um, that the diagnosis of ADHD confers risk for a host of, um, of negative outcomes, including substance abuse, um, not completing high school, um, uh, teen pregnancies, car accidents. There's a whole wide range of, of negative outcomes. Um, so, you know, another way to look at this is that when people say the diagnosis of ADHD is not real, um, I would counter that and say, well, it's a reliable diagnosis, one that um, clinicians can agree upon. And it's a diagnosis that once a child has that diagnosis, we know that child is at increased risk for a host of negative outcomes. Um, and if that's not enough to say that the diagnosis is real, or if that's not enough to say that a, a child uh, with ADHD um, should have treatment, um, that bar, I would say, is unreasonably high. Okay, so just to summarize the first point, um, ADHD can reliably be identified. It predicts uh, a wide range of negative outcomes. Um, and the other question that you might be having is, well, why is ADHD different from other disorders in medicine? Why don't we have that, that final bar of biological validity? And to that, I, I think the answer is actually fairly straightforward, and it, it has to do with the, the brain, um, and the brain being such an incredibly complicated organ. Um, so in psychiatry, we are dealing what, with what is by far and away the most complex organ um, in, in all of medicine. Uh, the brain, for example, is composed of 100 billion neurons, um, and each of those neurons has on order of a 1,000 synapses or connections. So we're talking about thousands, I'm sorry, we're talking about trillions of, of connections. Um, so a remarkably complex organ that we are trying, that we're working very hard to, to better understand, um, but where we still have a lot of work to do. Okay, um, the second myth that I wanna talk about um, is, that is that ADHD is merely a, either a modern phenomenon or purely an American or Western phenomenon. And the argument there is that the diagnosis is really just responding to pressure from, uh, from the pharmaceutical industry to increase prescription rates, um, or that it's a response to um, uh, academic pressures and the, the drive to succeed academically. And I, I want to be clear that um, I, I, I would never um, want to dismiss those as important concerns um, and things that could be um, potentially um, contributing to an overdiagnosis of ADHD. But what I do want to uh, push back against is the idea that ADHD um, is entirely um, explainable through those phenomenon, um, because that I think is is, is inaccurate, and I'm going to I'm going to tell you why. Um, the first, uh, the first point, which the, the misconception that ADHD is, is purely a modern phenomenon, it's actually quite easy to refute that if you look through the medical literature. Um, so if you go back, uh, you know, even, a, if you go back a century, um, you'll see descriptions, um, in the medical li literature of children, um, that look very much like an ADHD child. If you go back a century, that specific diagnosis or that specific label um, didn't exist, um, but physicians were describing children that were hyperactive, impulsive, inattentive, um, all the things that we would uh, put together to, uh, to make an ADHD diagnosis today. Um, some of the earliest reports uh, date back um, all the way to the 1700s. Um, and there's two um, uh, really nice examples of, 
this that I that I wanted to share. Um, one is uh, from uh, a uh, a, physi- a German physician um, Heinrich Hoffmann. Um, who uh, treated children in the 1800s. And then he wrote um, poems and uh, along with illustrations that describe these children that he was seeing in his practice. Uh, One great example of that is um, his description of Fidgety fidgety Phil, um, who he describes as, uh, let me see if Philip can be a little gentleman. Let me see if he is able to sit still for once at the table, but fidgety Phil won't sit still. He wriggles, he giggles, and then I declare, swings backwards and forwards and tilts up his chair. Um, so I, you know, I think what's clear what Dr. Hoffman is describing is a, a hyperactive, impulsive child. He didn't have that label of ADHD, uh, but clearly he was describing the, the same type of clinical presentation that today we would call ADHD. Um, Dr. Hoffman also uh, wrote about another child, Johnny uh, Look in the Air. It's about a a boy whose head is always in the clouds and he's wandering about. Um, And one day he's so lost in the clouds that he he stumbles into a pool of water. Um, So, again, uh, they at that in the 1800s didn't have the label of ADHD. But clearly what's being described here is a ADHD child who is highly inattentive. Um, the, the second aspect to this uh, misconception is that ADHD is purely a Western phenomenon or even an American phenomenon. Um, and in that um, aspect of the, the misconception, we also have really um, good science to refute that. Um, and this comes from what we call epidemiologic studies of the prevalence of ADHD. So essentially researchers going out into a community Um, assessing a wide number of children and determining um, the rates of uh, of ADHD. And uh, when that has been done, and it's been done across um, uh, most of the the world, um, in the African continent, in South America, Asia, North America, uh, Europe, um, we see that uh, ADHD is indeed found worldwide. and by and large, um, the rates are fairly consistent. So this <clears throat> this chart may be a little bit difficult to read, um, but on the last row, you have the worldwide rates, uh, which come in at about between five and six percent. And you see, as you go across continents, there's some variability in those rates, uh, but overall, they're they're reasonably consistent. Or to put it another way, um, they're consistent enough that it, it's hard to make the claim that um, ADHD is purely a Western phenomenon. If that were the case, we would see the rates very high in North America and Europe um, and very low um, in all other continents. And, and clearly, that's not what the, what the data are showing us. Okay, a third um, common misconception, um, and this is one that I think uh, parents very understandably often ask about, um, and that is whether ADHD uh, medications lead to substance abuse. And I I think what's driving that uh, misconception is a a very, um, very, very common uh, mistake in the way that we think where we equate correlation with causation. Um, And what I mean by that is that it is certainly true that children who have ADHD um, are more likely to uh, abuse substances And it's also true that children who have ADHD and take medication are more likely um, to abuse substances. But what's not true is that it's not the medication um, that's uh, driving that effect. So in other words, it's the the ADHD uh, that's increasing risk for substance use. It's not medication. Um, And again, we know that through um, longitudinal studies. So if we have a group of children with ADHD, Um, who are taking medication, another group who are not taking medication, and we follow them over time, the ones who are taking medication are at no increased risk um, of of, uh, substance abuse relative to the ones who have ADHD and are not taking medication. There's even some compelling data to suggest that treatment over time may even lower the risk of substance abuse. Uh, 
Um, an interesting aspect to this is that we think that um, part of the biology of ADHD, um, part of the biology that gives rise to symptoms of ADHD, um, is the same underlying biology that gives rise to substance abuse. Um, and those are uh, brain regions that are um, related to the transmission of dopamine. Um, the fourth myth that I wanted to briefly discuss, um, and again, this is one that commonly uh, comes up and it's a common question, um, is that um, it can't be ADHD because he focuses um, so well, um, particularly when he's playing video games. And I'm sure for many parents um, in the audience, um, you've seen this, that if your child has ADHD, uh, they may be very distracted or distractible in one setting, uh, but highly, highly focused um, in, in other settings. And I think the idea um, here to understand is that ADHD does not mean uh, no attention. Um, really what ADHD um, is about is a deficit in sustaining, or a better way to put it really is regulating attention. So environments or settings that are highly stimulating um, can actually lead to hyper-focus. <clears throat> and it's environments where the activities are more mundane, less stimulating, where you see uh, the distractibility really come to the surface. Okay, um, so having covered some of those um, common uh, misconceptions about ADHD, I now want to shift focus um, a bit um, and get into um, some of the MRI, MRI research um, that's being conducted, uh, particularly um, in the lab that I work in. And the, the two major areas uh, of focus that I'm going to talk about are on treatment development and prevention. Um, so the first issue is why do we need uh, new treatments for um, for ADHD? And I think um, the the point that I want to underscore here um, is that our current medication treatments for ADHD um, work quite well, um, but unfortunately, uh, many children um, stop uh, stop the treatment or stop taking the medication. Um, in fact, um, the majority of teenagers with ADHD will stop treatment uh, within two years. And we know that ADHD is a chronic uh, condition and really requires long-term treatment. Um, so the leading reason given uh, for stopping treatment is, is because of side effects. Um, so I think this really underscores the point that we need um, better, more refined treatments, um, treatments that are less prone uh, to side effects. Um, as uh, many of you uh, perhaps know, um, the, the first line medication treatment for ADHD are psychostimulant medications. Um, but when, what you may not be aware of is that psychostimulants were actually first developed and first used in children um, in the 1930s. Um, the, the stimulant treatments that we use today have slightly altered um, the delivery mechanisms. Um, so they've, they allow us to use long-acting versions. They allow us to use liquid formulations. Those things are, are very helpful. Uh, but the underlying um, pharmacology um, really hasn't changed in almost uh, a century. Um, so I think the, the important question there is, what can we do to accelerate uh, treatment development? We, we don't want to be waiting um, a century or two centuries uh, before uh, new um, improved treatments um, uh, can, can come out, can be developed. Um, so an approach um, that my lab is taking is using MRI, um, but in this case, not using MRI to understand what causes ADHD, um, and instead using MRI to understand how our treatments work. Um, so as I mentioned before, psychostimulant medications are the first line medication treatment for ADHD. And we know um, their sort of immediate impact, um, increasing transmission of dopamine, 
but we don't really know um, how they alleviate ADHD symptoms. So in other words, we don't know what changes uh, stimulate, stimulant medications cause in the brain. We don't know which of those changes are actually responsible for symptom improvement versus side effects. So a study that's ongoing in my lab um, is really trying to, to tease that apart. Um, what we're doing is we're taking, uh, we're enrolling um, children who have ADHD. Uh, we're doing a um, extensive uh, clinical and neuropsychological evaluation. Um, and then we obtain what's called multimodal MRI scans, where we um, look at uh, the brain from a variety of MRI perspectives. The next step is that we then um, use what's called a randomized design, where we randomly assign half of the children to a placebo treatment <clears throat> and the other half to a uh, psychostimulant treatment. We treat them uh, for several weeks in one of those two arms. And then at the end of that uh, course, we then repeat um, the evaluation and the MRI scan. And what that approach allows us to do is to compare um, the pre-treatment MRI data with the post-treatment MRI data. Um, and by having a placebo arm, we can disentangle effects that are um, just uh, due to the nonspecific uh, passing of time uh, versus effect that effects that are specific to the medication. Now, ultimately, what we want to do in this line of research is um, identify brain changes that are responsible for symptom improvement versus brain changes that are responsible for side effects. And then with that information um, in hand, uh, the next step would be to then uh, uh, develop uh, new medications that specifically uh, target um, those brain changes leading to, to symptom improvement. <clears throat> um, we also um, have conducted uh, this line of research um, in parallel with, with a uh, human or, or child study um, but then also with a rodent study. Um, and in the rodent study, uh, we use the exact same design where we um, have a group of rodents, half of them are, they're all given MRI scans, half of them are treated with placebo, half with um, a stimulant medication, um, and then we scan them uh, again sometime later. And the reason why we're doing that is because <clears throat> we wanna understand um, medication-induced changes at the level of MRI, um, but even more so, we want to understand it at the cellular level. Um, and the advantage of doing this in a uh, rodent model is that at the end of the study, we then can dissect the rodent brain um, and understand um, at a individual um, cellular level what's actually causing the changes that we see on MRI scan. <clears throat> Okay, so that's one uh, line of investigation that we've been working with. Um, the other area that we're working on um, is prevention. And I think the, the first question to answer in that regard is why, uh, why do we think prevention is um, so important? Um, and the reason um, is sort of is highlighted um, in this graph here. Um, if you compare the diagnostic rates of ADHD from the mid 1990s to the to 2015, uh, the rates in the U.S. have nearly doubled. Um, now, it's it's certainly uh, possible, even likely, um, that some of that increase is because of um, more awareness. So the actual rates of ADHD may not have gone up that much. It's just that we're, <clears throat> we're more aware of the condition and are identifying children with ADHD uh, more readily. But um, it still is a doubling of the rate. And I think it's unlikely that it's entirely attributable to, um, to improved awareness. There is a, a reasonable chance that the actual rate of ADHD is indeed going up. Um, and uh, I think that underscores the, the need for preventive uh, approaches. 
So one of the things that um, the field as a whole um, in my lab in particular is really interested um, in better understanding are the impacts of prenatal exposures. Um, so in other words, um, uh, exposures during pregnancy um, that can influence the development of the fetal brain. Um, and the reason why we are so interested in that is because there are several um, studies now, primarily um, in uh, either epidemiologic studies or in uh, animal models, that have linked a variety of prenatal exposures with increased risk for ADHD. Uh, and the exposures that I'm referring to include stress, trauma, uh, various drugs, uh, chemicals, and even diet or obesity um, may uh, in increase risk of the, of the child developing ADHD. Um, and the reason why this uh, prenatal period may be so important is because of the um, extensive brain development um, that goes on during that period. So if you look at this figure in the bottom, um, you see the central nervous system during the first trimester and just how dramatically um, it changes um, and grows uh, over the course of gestation. And uh, various exposures um, can impact um, how that development unfolds. So, uh, my lab and, and other labs are uh, really interested in conducting studies now where we obtain um, MRI scans shortly after birth in babies. Um, and the reason why we think that is so important is because it allows us to get um, an image of the, the brain um, before all of the postnatal um, influences have really taken hold. Um, so another way to think about that, if we, if we really want to understand how prenatal influences affect brain development, we want to get an image of the brain before all the things that happen after birth uh, really have their influence. Um, so we bring uh, babies in very early on, about two to three weeks after birth. Um, and again, we use this multimodal MRI approach. Um, what I mean by multimodal um, is several different uh, MRI modalities. Um, the, the most common one, um, and the one that mo people are usually think of when they say MRI, is what's called structural MRI. And you can see the baby here is looking at a, a picture of a structural MRI scan. Um, and with structural MRI, um, that allows us to look at the size and the shapes of different uh, brain regions. Uh, but we also um, have other approaches. One of them um, is called diffusion MRI, where we can actually uh, map out uh, the white matter tracks uh, that connect different brain regions. Um, and then we can also look at uh, functional MRI, uh, where we try to assess um, which brain regions are active um, over a period of time. Um, in the studies that we're conducting now, as I um, alluded to before, we are enrolling um, women during pregnancy. Um, we then do a detailed assessment of various exposures during pregnancy. Shortly after birth, we obtain um, MRI scans on the babies. Um, and then all throughout childhood, we continue to do um, detailed assessments of the development of attention and hyperactive behaviors. And our goal is to con continue to follow these children up to age six through 10 um, when the ADHD diagnosis uh, really comes to, to light. Um, and what that will allow us to do is to determine whether the prenatal exposures that we're seeing are influencing brain development and whether that continues on and predicts um, the subsequent development of ADHD. Now, the overall goal of this line of research uh, would be to isolate those prenatal factors that increase risk, um, and then hopefully to be able to reduce those exposures, uh, not necessarily entirely eliminate them. Things like stress will never be elim eliminated entirely, um, but if we can reduce them, 
um, we can uh, lower the risk of a child developing ADHD. Um, so we have a series of studies um, where we're using this approach. Um, there's a study that we're conducting um, in New York, in Puerto Rico, um, another study in Brazil, um, a study on uh, prenatal drug exposure that we're conducting in, uh, in Quebec, um, and then another study looking at uh, prenatal diet and obesity, and that study we're conducting in New York. So uh, to conclude, um, I hope I've um, uh, convinced you that ADHD is indeed a real diagnosis, um, that it exists worldwide. Um, and third, that although we have um, good treatments, uh, we really need to do uh, more to promote better treatments, more refined treatments, um, and to improve our prevention strategies. So with that, uh, I want to open it up to any questions. Uh, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Really very good. Um, there are all, there's a whole range of questions. So if I, I, if perhaps you have to repeat yourself with, after mentioning it in your slides, I'm sorry, but people no just have these pressing questions. Sure. Uh, what about a spec scan? Can it diagnose ADD? No, it cannot. Um, I, I know that uh, people may read that it can in the popular press, um, but unfortunately, um, no, um, no uh, brain imaging modality uh, can currently diagnose ADHD. There's just too much overlap between um, what you see in an ADHD brain versus a non-ADHD brain. In other words, we just don't have the, um, the level of detail yet to really make a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion about TOVA as an objective measure to help diagnose ADHD? So there are different neuropsychological um, assessments um, that can be used. TOVA is, is one of them that is commonly used. Another one is the continuous performance task. Mm -hmm. um, and those can be, be helpful um, in uh, giving the diagnosing clinician um, additional information, um, but in and of themselves, they, they are not diagnostic and they, and they shouldn't be used to diagnose ADHD. And the reason for that is because there's really two reasons. One is because um, someone could do very poorly on the TOVA, um, but it's not because they have ADHD, it's because they have a different condition. So for example, someone who is profoundly depressed um, is also going to have impairments in attention. Um, so it lacks what we call um, the specificity to ADHD. The other issue um, is that it lacks what we call sensitivity. Um, so there are, going to be, there are going to be children who have ADHD, and in certain settings, their attention is very impaired. But for whatever reason, when they do the TOVA, their attention does not, um, does not look so bad. It's similar to that example of the, the video game, where in certain contexts, uh, a child who has even the worst case of ADHD um, can still actually pay attention quite well. Mm -hmm. where, where neuropsychological uh, assessments are more helpful um, is um, to really uh, define and better understand a, a learning disability. Um, many children, on the order of about half of children with ADHD, also have a learning disability. Um, and it can be uh, very helpful in that regard. Um, but less so for the diagnosis of ADHD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about co-occurring conditions? Does brain imaging have any any role to play in that co-occurring conditions with ADHD? That's a good that's a good question. So, <clears throat> I think there's there's I would look at that um, from both a research perspective um, and a clinical perspective. On the clinical side, you know, when, when, when a family goes to uh, a doctor to be evaluated, um, unfortunately, the answer there is simple. It, it's unfortunately, no, it really doesn't. Um, we are just not at the point where we know enough about the ADHD brain to make it clinically um, useful. However, um, on the research side, um, it is quite important to think about co-occurring conditions. Um, and the reason for that is because um, as our understanding of the brain improves, uh, 
um, we are looking at the brain much more from the perspective of underlying circuits or brain systems. Um, and those brain systems um, do, don't have a one-to-one -one relationship with a psychiatric diagnosis. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example that, that will hopefully make that clearer. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the brain system um, that we um, that we believe is involved in um, the pleasure response or what we call reward processing, that's a brain system that um, has been um, repeatedly associated with ADHD, uh, but it's also a brain system um, that's highly associated with substance use disorders. Um, so as we learn more about the brain, it's becoming clearer um, that certain underlying brain systems may predispose uh, to several conditions rather than one isolated condition. And that is very likely why uh, we see um, um, so much uh, co-occurrence of psychiatric conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> this is very specific, but can ADHD get worse because of a severe concussion? Um, that's that's also a, a good question, um, and certainly um, a concussion, a severe concussion or, or uh, traumatic brain injury um, can absolutely impair attention. Um, so certainly it can exacerbate ADHD. Um, mo most typically, um, the, uh, the effects of a concussion uh, tend to be time limited. Um, but the, the the severity of the concussion or the traumatic uh, brain injury would likely dictate that. Mm -hmm. What about a child who who uh, who experienced trauma? Um, wondering, one parent is asking if that could uh, further uh, impair a child's ADHD. I mean, I I don't know the interplay between the two, but that's what right. this parent is asking. Yeah. So um, what tr uh, trauma, uh, of course, comes in um, lots of different, uh, there's lots of different types of trauma. Um, and so I'm going to answer that. Con I'm going to answer that question um, in the context of uh, psychological uh, trauma. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, physical abuse. Um, and uh, the answer there is that absolutely, yes. Um, Trauma and childhood adversity um, increases risk for a whole host of psychiatric conditions, and certainly um, including uh, including ADHD. Um, the uh, trauma and adversity during childhood is one of the largest risk factors uh, for any psychiatric condition, and that um, includes things like PTSD. Uh, but also includes ADHD, uh, depression, bipolar mm -hmm. disorder. Um, it, it is a um, it is an equal uh, opportunity offender, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that's um, uh, important to consider is that um, the the cycle may go both ways. Um, in that, having ADHD. Um, in and of itself may um, unfortunately also increase the risk of a child um, suffering some sort of trauma or adversity. Um, so in other words, um, an ADHD child um, due to any number of possible causes, potentially impulsivity um, or, or other causes um, could wind up in a situation uh, where they are unfortunately more likely to experience trauma. Um, so it's a it's a complicated um, and unfortunately very difficult problem. Mm -hmm. Do you have an opinion on using neurofeedback in the treatment of ADHD? Um, neurofeedback is uh, a, a, an, an interesting um, and in some ways very compelling um, approach. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with it, the idea basically um, is that. Um, using um, EEG to measure um, electrical uh, brain waves. Um, um, there are certain brain waves that are associated with better focus and better attention. And a child can be, uh, the idea is that a child can be trained to put their brain into a state where, um, where their focus and attention is improved. Um, unfortunately, um, the, the, 
research on neurofeedback uh, remains fairly equivocal. Um, so um, there are some studies um, suggesting that it is effective. Um, however, um, the studies that have used the most rigorous types of designs and have had uh, the best um, control conditions um, and the, blessed, the best blinding conditions um, suggest that it, it, it may not be effective or, or it may not be any more effective um, than a placebo treatment. Uh-huh. Uh, a couple of women have asked that they've been diagnosed late in life uh, and they were wondering as you look, as you refine treatments, um, do, you, do you envision any kind of gender specific treatments? Mm. I, I, that's also a, a great question. Um, and there's actually, there's two, uh, two parts of that that I, that I want to answer. Um, the first part was, uh, you mentioned that the, the question came from adults. Yes. Um, and so for, um, for, for decades, really, we, we've thought of ADHD as a condition, um, that always, uh, first manifests in childhood. And then for some individuals, um, it diminishes over development, um, and for others, it, it persists. Um, very recently, uh, in the last uh, five or six years, um, there's been increasing um, data and, and, and very uh, well done studies to suggest that that may not be the case, um, that there may actually be um, individuals who clearly did not have ADHD as children and that the ADHD only emerges um, in adulthood. Um, and uh, th this is sort of a, a new area, uh, and there's certainly questions about that that still need to be sorted out. Uh, mm -hmm. But another compelling aspect of that is that when we look at the um, underlying um, uh, genetics associated uh, with ADHD, this is still preliminary, um, but we are beginning to see um, that the genetic predisposition to ADHD that emerges in childhood may be distinct um, from the genetics that predispose to adult onset ADHD. Mm. And if that actually um, bears out and proves to be true, um, I, I think one can extrapolate from that um, and uh, and suspect that uh, distinct treatments indeed are likely to emerge. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still a far away from figuring out what exactly those treatments for adult onset ADHD would be. Currently, it's the same treatment that we use in child ADHD. Um, but if the underlying genetics and therefore underlying biology are distinct, it stands to reason um, that a different line of, of treatment uh, may indeed be effective. Um, and I think a very similar um, line of thought um, could be used to, um, to predict that um, uh, distinct treatments for different sexes also may be feasible. We're certainly not there yet, um, but understanding how sex differences determine the biology of different conditions in ADHD um, is certainly uh, an area of, of great uh, interest in the research world. Mm-hmm. Uh, one mom asked, my son was born at 28 weeks. Does prematurity increase the chances of ADHD? Is there any correlation? Yes, yes there, there is a correlation um, that prematurity uh, does seem to increase the risk for ADHD. Why exactly it does that? Unfortunately, we, we don't know. Um, but children who are born prematurely are at increased risk. Um, and similarly, um, uh, birth-related traumas also seem to increase the risk for ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what would those I, be? Birth-related traumas? Could you just oh, if, if, a, if a if a child during birthing goes through a sustained period with inadequate oxygen, for example, uh -huh. um, that could increase risk for ADHD. Um, we're unfortunately not at the point where we can say, okay, this because the ADHD. Um, arose in that type of context, we can then prescribe a specific treatment for that ADHD presentation. Um, that's certainly an area that the field is would like to move to, um, 
But for now, um, we don't have that level of specificity in our treatments. So the treatment still remains the same, uh, regardless of the, um, the, the early risk factors. Mm -hmm. But it is that type of information is helpful um, to a clinician, for example, in, in figuring out the, whether the child really has a diagnosis of ADHD. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple of people wanted to ask in your studies where you're brain imaging babies, uh, does the mother have ADHD? Have you diagnosed it in her? Um, another, another great question. Um, not necessarily. Um, mm. What we are trying to do, um, and this, this, bring, this is a, a difficult issue because um, certainly uh, uh, an aspect of ADHD is genetic. Um, and so the child is going to have half of the same genes that the, the mother has. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the, the, the mother could be passing on risk for um, ADHD if she indeed has it. Um, so what we do in our studies is um, there's a couple different approaches that we use. One is that we um, assess the we assess the women for childhood ADHD, um, and then we can statistically control for that. In other words, testing whether the prenatal exposure increases risk for ADHD above and beyond some familial or genetic effect. That's one approach that we're using. Um, and then another approach that we're using, which is more quantitative, um, is that we are um, genotyping um, the mothers. Um, and there's a particular um, genetic profile called the polygenic risk score um, that tries to quantify um, the genetic risk for ADHD. And then we can ask the same question. So does the prenatal exposure increase risk for ADHD above and beyond that polygenic risk score? Mm -hmm. This is an intriguing question. Is, it, is a baby born with ADHD or does it develop over time? Good question. Um, I would say both can be true. Um, I, I, I suspect, um, and this is really in the, the realm of, of speculation because we, mm -hmm. we don't have solid evidence to really say this definitively, um, but I suspect there are um, children who are born um, with um, either such a high sort of uh, genetic risk um, that their brain is already sort of formed in such a way that um, they almost inevitably will develop ADHD. Um, but I suspe suspect the majority of cases are um, somewhere um, in between where either genetic factors or prenatal exposures have increase the risk for ADHD, um, but where that outcome isn't yet determined. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, development is, brain development is remarkably plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, there are lots and lots of changes going on from birth up until, um, you know, the first few decades of life. Um, and what factors ultimately influence uh, that development, um, increasing or decreasing risk for ADHD, um, are still things that, that we haven't uh, well worked out. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting one as well. Do we know about brain changes due to long-term stimulant, stimulant use uh, mm -hmm. by people with ADHD? Additionally, what about long-term effects of lack of treatment for people with ADHD? But maybe let's just take on the long-term stimulant use. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the... Um, there's a couple ways to, to look at that. Um, so if you if you take a group of children um, who have ADHD um, and uh, obtain MRI scans on them, um, and then um, they're treated with uh, stimulant medication, and then they're scanned again, uh, say, 10 years later, just hypothetical, um, you could look at brain changes over that time, um, but where it gets very difficult is that if you did that, you wouldn't be able to determine which of those brain changes were attributable to the medication versus brain changes that were just attributable to development, right? Mm -hmm. Because children are growing for 10 years and, and that process in and of itself is going to lead to substantial, substantial brain changes. Um, but um, the study that my lab and other labs have done 
um, suggest um, that there are significant um, changes um, in brain function um, that are attributable to stimulant medications. Um, but um, those changes are short-lived. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we see that when we treat children with ADHD and a stimulant medication and that you, you see um, the medications can be extremely effective in the short term, um, but once the medications stop within a day, um, the symptoms reemerge. Mm. Mm. One of the things um, that brain imaging um, has uh, shown is that um, the, the, the development of the brain in children with ADHD um, seems to be um, somewhat uh, delayed. Um, so in other words, the overall course of development in children with versus without ADHD is very similar. Um, it's almost as if the ADHD brain is a couple years behind. Um, but the, the very optimistic part of that is that it ultimately does catch up for most children with ADHD. Um, so by the age, you know, by, by adolescence, um, it's looking very uh, much like an um, unaffected uh, non-ADHD brain. Hmm. Uh, this is a, a thought. I think this might be the last question. I don't know, depending on how you answer it. Uh, you talked about, one mom asked, you talked about prevention. I thought ADHD was genetic. So I guess she's saying, how do you prevent if it's right. genetic? Okay, well, I'll let so, you go. Yeah. Yeah, let me answer that. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's a great question, and that, that comes up frequently. Um, and it, it, what you're saying is true, um, uh, but only half true, um, in the sense that the, the, we think the, the lion's share of ADHD cases are not caused just by genetics. It's what we call a gene by environment interaction. So in other words, the, the genes set the stage um, but certain environmental inputs um, trigger that. Um, and, and so what we're trying to look at and try to understand is that, that environmental component. Mm -hmm. it, it may be true that there are some cases of ADHD that are purely attributable to genes, um, but the lion's share of cases, it's a combination of genes and environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um let's see just looking for another question i i thought i didn't want to run over but uh where did where did the idea that this one might be simple and straightforward where did the idea the maternal stress slash trauma and how that affects the affects the development of adhd come from where did that mm. it, it, so, so two sources. Um, one in, in human studies, um, essentially through observational research. Mm -hmm. uh, so, following you know large populations um, and noting that um, among women who reported that uh, they experienced a high level of stress during pregnancy, their children had increased rates of ADHD. Um, but then also um, through um, animal studies um, where the scientists um, can actually uh, manipulate the levels of stress during, uh, during gestation um, and then following those offspring and seeing um, higher levels of, of hyperactivity mm -hmm. um, and impulsivity. That's very interesting. I, I think the hour is up. Everyone had lots of great questions. You had great answers. I found it really an intriguing webinar. I thank you so much for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Yep. And thanks to all of the attendees for being here as well. Next week, Dr. Mark Burton will address the social challenges of ADHD and autism, similarities and differences, and the most effective uh, treatments and interventions for both. So thanks for being here, everyone, and have a great day.